This was after I took the little label thing off, and I popped that up, and the ball was loose. It was like, whoa. And so I did the same thing you did. I popped it back in. I don't remember the lid being Yeah, and mom doesn't remember. Sometimes she does, sometimes she tells me, but sometimes she doesn't. Mm-mm. No. I think it'll just take some time. You know? However, you know, mom's not going to be very happy, though. I hope she doesn't remember what the doctor said to her. Because tomorrow's Thursday. <laughs> Surprised what she remembers. Uh huh. It's, yeah, for thing. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. If you start to get out of bed tomorrow morning, I'm leaving. Today's yeah, Thursday. it's Thursday. Today's Thursday. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I can strangle the the doctor Sunday when I see him. Don't you say those things. That's Thursday <laughs> next week. Unless you. Well. Yeah, I think you need more. Need to be more generic, you know. Yeah. Instead when you of, go home and get well, that type of thing, it's yeah. going to be like more common sense. Yeah, I think it would have been better. So, yeah. It may be anything mm -hmm. that she won't remember, too. That could be. Uh, I, I still don't. <laughs> but I have time to start. We're in First Peter chapter five. Do what? Yeah. Well, Pat, Pat McBride may still be sick. Maxine. Quality, not quantity. Jensen. That's true. John. He'll probably be here in a little bit. I don't know about Donna what her situation might be. If she's sick or not, I don't know. Or Tommy might not still not yeah, be feeling better. There's Kathy. There's Kathy. Yeah. Betty's still sick. Yep, she's feeling better. She's feeling better. But decided better. not to try tonight. Well, I don't blame her. Yeah. Getting out tonight here probably wouldn't have been good. i got to remember to let Ron know so he can make that announcement that she's sick. And Maxine, she's still sick, and Pat's still sick. <laughs> but we need to check on Donna. Is she sick, or? Well, I don't know. She's oh, not here. Oh, just like me. So, uh, and your mother, is she doing better? She's still improving. Still, still improving. Still. Yeah. Boredom is the main problem. I mean, one of the main problems. Yeah. No indication of being able to go home anytime soon. No, no. Okay. Yeah. Still got a lot to do with the cognitive skills and, and the balance and the occupational therapy thing. The physical therapy is done well. Yeah. Okay. Walk along on it pretty good. Okay. All right. Well, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. And Gene, you want to lead us in that prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy word, the promises we have from thee, and we really pray for we think of the lessons we have through the scriptures, as written by the apostle, by Peter, to bring in my memory, the lessons that are there, that we might be strengthened in our lives, in our lives before we leave, and we accept you in all that we do. We pray that we forgive our sins and bless us all the way to study. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay.
Okay, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. One through four. Let's read those. And uh, Rob, why don't we start with you? Do you mean First Peter chapter five? I did say Ephesians, didn't That's I? What you said. I just want to make sure you want us where you want us. Yeah, I still want to be in First Peter chapter five, okay. verses right. one through four. <laughs> Go to the chart, not what I say. That's what John says. That's John's. <laughs> The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those who entrusted, over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. All right. So when we talk about elders and everything, of course we know the apostle Peter uh, was indeed an elder, as he says here in these first few verses. But we need to understand that regardless of what position we hold in the church, that it is uh, sometimes difficult for one to discharge one's responsibilities in the church. But it is especially hard to tend to business when there are many obstacles uh, in the way. The fiery trial did not lessen the importance uh, here uh, with these uh, Christians uh, of satisfying their regular day-to-day -day obligations. Nor did it relieve those with special duties from doing them as faithfully as ever, and perhaps even more so. And so Peter addresses uh, the, the elders here. And he begins by saying, the elders who are among you, I exhort. So when you think about this, one group within local churches who had obligations beyond those incurred by every faithful member was indeed the eldership. And it is important to have faithful elders, obviously, and we all recognize that, especially in stressful circumstances. Someone must make decisions for the group. Someone must give advice and encouragement. And work a foster a uh, or work to foster a calm atmosphere among the members, uh, men with age and life experiences, and who have a good character are best suited to guide those uh, faced with persecution or trouble. And it is vital that they lead well. Uh, it is also essential that the rest follow well. Peter, by virtue of his inspiration and practical experience as a fellow out elder uh, was well equipped and uh, and the reason he was well equipped to uh, talk about this is because of the fact that he was a, a fellow elder according to his instructions we learn that elders are men who must be exhorted so what does the word exhort mean encouraged, encouraged okay uh, could it mean anything else Huh? <laughs> Exhort, correct? Correct. And, well, that's exactly right. Encouragement is certainly uh, part of it. But elders should also be not necessarily corrected, but warned, uh, made aware of situations uh, so that they might properly do their duty. Uh, because theirs is no easy task. Uh, and difficult jobs often come uh, or often require a little prodding. Uh, sometimes there are members who need uh, extra encouragement or, or maybe some uh, uh, discipline by the elders and, and maybe the elders might be a little bit reluctant and so sometimes they need a little prodding, a little encouragement to do these things. The elders should always welcome the encouragement of their congregation but while our elders are not to be subjected to unsubstantiated uns, uh, uh, accusations, we know that because when Paul was talking to First Timothy or to Timothy in First Timothy chapter five and verse nineteen, uh, let's go over there and read that. Uh, Janice, you have that. Mm -hmm. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Okay. But the point is that elders should always receive constructive suggestions and should welcome those constructive uh, suggestions. 
if elders are going to properly lead uh, the congregation, if elders are uh, sincerely interested in the welfare, the spiritual welfare of every member of the congregation, elders should welcome constructive suggestions. The fact that these men have such a serious responsibility necessitates that they fulfill definite spiritual requirements before being appointed to this office. And we're not going to take the time to read these requirements, but they are in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and also Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9 gives the requirements. What I will tell you is if you look at those requirements, there's only two that are required of elders that are not required of members. What are they? Husband of one wife. Husband of one wife. And must have believing children. All the rest, all, all members of the Lord's church are required to have those same qualifications. And each one of us should work towards those qualifications. When we look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and we look at verses 2 and 3 again, uh, the idea is to shepherd the flock. Uh, feed the flock of God which is among you. That's what uh, Peter is saying here. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you. Good shepherds have a deep concern for every sheep in the flock and for every spiritual situation that touches each sheep. Good shepherds have one goal, and that is to lead the whole flock to heaven's eternal pasture without the loss of one precious soul. Thus, they do a couple of things. Number one, they protect the sheep from whatever dangers may arise uh, to threaten their way, and we find in Titus, the first chapter in verse 9 there. Uh, John, you have that? Holding fast the faithful word, as he has been taught, that he may be able to sound, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the game slayers. Okay. And so, uh, elders have that responsibility to ensure that things taught here uh, among the brethren is uh, indeed God's word. Uh, when we bring in men from outside the congregation, uh, gospel preaching and everything, it's our responsibility to make sure that these individuals are sound, that they're going to preach and teach a sound message from the word of God. And it's our job to uh, listen intently to ensure that they are indeed uh, sound and accurate. Uh, because it is our responsibility to feed the sheep as a, uh, a, a spiritual diet, if you will. And that's the second area uh, that we must do. They will try to remain aware of the needs, and I'm talking about elders, the needs and problems, uh, and elders should not be considered as nosy when they display interest in each member of the congregation. And... Uh, And then also, Peter makes a comment that uh, uh, elders should not, by constraint, but willingly, serve. Uh, this is the first of three positive and three negative aspects of an elder's work. Uh, look again when he says, The shepherd of the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion or not by constraint, King James Version says, but willingly. All right? So the idea is to serve willingly and eagerly. And when elders are uh, respected among the congregation and when the congregation follows the eldership and everything, it makes the job pleasant. Uh, it makes the job unpleasant, though, when the elders uh, looking out for the behalf of the, the members of the congregation have to take disciplinary action upon someone and then other members in the congregation disagree with that and, and begin to uh, dispute with the elders over that instead of looking at what the scriptures say and recognizing that the whole purpose of any action, uh, good or bad, is for the design of saving that spiritual soul. Uh, and so elders should indeed serve willingly and eagerly. But it is unlikely that reluctant elders will be able to inspire willingness and commitment in others. Therefore, the first qualification to be met by the man who aspires 
to the eldership is that he must desire the position. And that's 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But it also says you should desire a good work. That is true. You should the desire. Is, the work is an important one to do. Yes, absolutely. And, and that's what Paul is saying to Timothy. Now, I, I take a little issue with this because I think sometimes it's a little misunderstood of what Paul is saying here uh, to Timothy. I, I personally think that if a person is qualified to serve in any position in the church, whether it be a song leader, a Bible class teacher, uh, a deacon, a preacher, a uh, preacher, one who visits the elderly, uh, whatever the position, whatever the talent is that God has given us, if we refuse to utilize that talent, then we will answer to God for that. And I think if an individual meets the qualifications and, re and is able uh, and, and has the ability to serve the, as an elder, that individual should have that desire because they want to do God's will. And, and no individual, though, should be campaigning for a position. Uh, one who campaigns for a division, uh, a position, oftentimes has uh, other motives for doing that. And it's a great honor, though, when one is asked, would you be willing to serve in a position like this, whether it be a Bible class teacher, a song leader, or, or uh, a preacher, or uh, an elder, or a deacon, uh, when they're asked to serve, then they're, they should consider it an honor because the congregation is looking at that individual and saying, hey, we think that you would be an individual that would look out for our best interest, that would help encourage us, that would help uh, us all look to that day that uh, Jesus comes again. Any comments on this first uh, aspect of an elder's work? Right, also in verse 2, then he says, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. This describes an attitude to serve God and not to seek a means of financial gain. This is a little bit what I was talking about there. Elder, elders who labor in word and in teaching are worthy of uh, a stipend or uh, finances. Uh, we can go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. And verse 17, I didn't put that up there on the screen, but uh, Kathy, if you have that, if you'll turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Let the elders who rule, rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Okay. But I would say this, if monetary gain is an individual's motive for serving his elder, he has become corrupted by the greed of filthy lucre. And so one should not be serving in that position for specific monetary gain. Do you Does, know any elders that are paid? I mean, just out of curiosity. I, mean, I do I, not know of any that are paid. Yeah. I know of some that were looking to be paid. Oh, yeah? Uh, and I know of some preachers that were looking to be paid once they retired. Uh, they were looking for the congregation to buy the house for them. Uh, and give them a retirement fund. These are the wrong attitudes to have, obviously. But to answer your question, Kathy, I don't know of anyone specifically that is being paid now. I don't know. Ron, do you know of anybody? I'm, I have known in the past of a congregation that uh, mercifully support, fully supported an elder who uh, was giving his full-time work uh, in the work of you know, that was other elders, too. But, yeah. uh, he spent more time than anybody else and he was uh, in a situation where he didn't use the financial support too and so they did just like the passage says he was ruling well and worthy of the government. but he did not seek that himself no, that he didn't seek the it congregation right. and so that there was a need and uh, he was uh, wanting to serve and willing to serve and did and so they did and, and in and some ways got gospel preachers who are also elders who are receiving support. Right, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, in more, essence, more when James was here, he was yeah. a gospel preacher, but he was also an elder. He was receiving support. When I was preaching in Olathe, Kansas, of course, I worked for Pfizer at the time and everything, and it was a congregation, and they only had about 
I can't remember now, about 35 members when we first started going there. And, and uh, you know, I didn't need the money, so I didn't take any salary or anything. But as we began to grow and everything, and, and I knew that I wasn't going to be there permanently, uh, I, I felt a need that uh, the congregation should start working towards being able to support a preacher at a later time. So I, uh, in the business meeting, I did mention to him, I said, look, I said, uh, I think you people need to start paying me a salary. I don't care how much it is, and it, it's none of your business. What I do with it, I may put it all back in the current contribution, but you need to start setting aside a certain amount each week uh, for uh, a salary, and this will help you uh, in your transition towards getting another preacher sometime. And so they did. They agreed to give me $250 a week, and I did, in fact, turn around and put it right back in the contribution, so uh, it was just kind of all a show deal. But they do have a full-time preacher there now. Uh, haven't been in contact with them for a while, uh, but I do know they do support a full-time preacher, and I, as far as I know, he's not getting any outside support. John? You mentioned James. I think James was being paid as a preacher. He not, was. Not as an elder. He was, right. but he was also serving as an elder. And that's all yeah, I mean, he was serving as an elder, but yeah. the pay part of it became, was because of the preacher. Right, yeah. right. Which, which, in my personal opinion, is, is a mistake. As a preacher, so is more. That is a mistake. Well, creates, and the Apostle Paul... It creates more problems than it solves. It can, uh, and I don't disagree with that. The Apostle Paul said uh, to the Corinthian brethren that there were some who were designated to be elders, some <coughs> designated to be uh, preachers, and, and so on, and all these teachers, and, and so on. Uh, and. You know, a preacher has a responsibility themselves uh, and a full-time work and everything to add the work of an elder onto them uh, just increases the workload and some, sometimes can complicate it. So I, I don't disagree with you at all, Gene, that if if there's not a need for a preacher to serve as an elder, then uh, the preacher should do their job and the elders should do their job. And I think everybody pretty well agrees with that. Any other thoughts? All right, so he goes on then in verse 3, he says, Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you. Uh, this is the third aspect. Uh, the King James Version uses the phrase, Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. I'm sorry, I I'm sorry. Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Is the way the King James uh, words it. Uh, this further amplifies the method by which one is to oversee the flock. Uh, in other words, elders are to be modes or patterns after which brethren can fashion themselves in the service of God. Uh, they should be able to look at an elder and say, you know, that's a good example. Uh, they are not to be domineering, talking about elders, uh, they're not to be domineering lords who make decisions without considering what is in the best interest of the whole. They must be strong-willed, but not self-willed. And they have no authority to change or add to God's law, but they do have oversight within the scope of making judgments concerning matters that assist in obeying God's commands. Okay? An eldership, there should not be one head elder, all elders hold an equal position, and all elders should be in agreement with one another. It's not a vote where, in the case we have four elders here, uh, if three of them vote yes and one votes no, then that passes it. No, we all agree or we don't agree. It's as simple as that, because we're here looking out for the best interest of each and every member, including ourselves. I'm looking out for Ron, Ron's looking out for me. We have that responsibility <coughs> towards each other. And therefore, we uh, should have a unanimous decision when we come to the decisions of what's best for the congregation. Uh, and we should, in fact, encourage the congregation to give us feedback and suggestions. Uh, we're getting ready to start talking about the 2015 budget right now. And uh, uh, there are some things we'll have to talk about. Uh, 
that will have, to some extent, some positive impact for 2015. Some might have a negative impact. For example, uh, we now have a $25,000 deductible if we have hail and wind damage to this building. Wow. <laughs> and that's not because we've replaced the roof twice. The whole state of Oklahoma has had their deductibles increased. But what that, it went from $1,000 to $25,000. So what that means is that we have to have a little bit more money in reserve just in case we have a... Did it go to a percentage of the value? Well, I called Brotherhood and I asked them because I was a little concerned. I thought, well, maybe they made a mistake here. Maybe it's supposed to be $2,500, not $25,000. And I also thought they raised it because we have had hail damage. But in the state of Oklahoma, they cannot raise our premiums or anything because of that. And our premiums did go up, or, or they're going up, $785. They can raise your premiums because there was a tornado on board. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and, and that's what they did. Because of, yeah. because of all the storms in the state of Oklahoma, everybody's deductible got increased. And one congregation, I don't know what religion it was or anything, but she said, she said, well, if there's any consequence, one congregation got their deductible raised to $100,000. <laughs> no, I just bring that up because these are things that... very big, huge village now. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Something like that has nothing to do with the spiritual condition of the souls here, but these are still some considerations the elders have to make. The primary considerations the elders make, though, is for the spiritual well-being of the souls here, and that's where we spend the bulk of our time. Good elderships will do that. Where is it, where is it, it says they watch for your souls? Oh, I can't think of that verse. I didn't hear the question. They watch for your they souls. Watch for their souls. What verse is it? The elders, they watch for your souls. Oh, yeah, it's Hebrews. That's what I was thinking, but I can't think of the chapter and the verse. No, I know wrong. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. Okay, we're going to read on down to verse 20 here in a moment, uh, so, of Hebrews 13. But uh, that's the verse, Hebrews 13, 17. Thank you, Ron. Okay, any comments on the third aspect here? All right, we look at verse, verse 4 then, and uh, what we see here in verse 4 is, When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. <clears throat> now, remember, he begins, the elders who are among you I exhort. So he's talking to the whole group, but at this point he's specifically addressing the elders. And he's telling them here in four, verse 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. No other person stands in the position of authority as Jesus Christ. Matthew 28th chapter, verses 18 through 20. Uh, let's see, uh, Florence, is it your turn? This is the Great Commission. We all know this. Uh, Jesus Christ is saying to his disciples, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, <clears throat> All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and I, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay, so Jesus says all authority is given to me. And we go to Hebrews, the 13th chapter, and I know I have verse 20 up here, but uh, let's, Ron read verse 17, Jensen, let's read verses 18 through 20. Uh, because what the Hebrew writer referred to him, uh, to Jesus Christ, as the great shepherd of the sheep, but he also includes uh, the shepherds of the church here, Hebrews 13, verse 17. Uh, read 18 through 20 for us. Pray for us. We are, we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead that the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Okay. So the Hebrew writer is saying pray for us 
and so he includes himself as a shepherd here. This is why some think, and I, and I am one of those that believes that Hebrews was written by uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, but we don't know that for sure. Whoever wrote it included himself as an elder there. Elders serve under him, him being God, uh, him being Jesus Christ, and elders must imitate Christ's example in caring for God's people. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2, and Ron, read verse 21 and 25 for us. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Verse 25, for you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Okay. And so elders had that responsibility. Just as Jesus Christ and just as God cares for his people and God desires that all men be saved, elders should have that same desire that every member of this congregation be saved. That means that we reach out, we encourage those who are weak, we do what we can. And our prayer to God for those who are unfaithful, those whose uh, faith needs to be increased, would be should be that God uses us as an instrument. Our prayer should not be that God increases their faith, but God uses us as an instrument to encourage them, to sit down with them and study with them. John? I've got a question. Yes, sir. Verse 1 says, The elders which are among you I exhort. Mm-hmm. Okay, this means I'm writing this to all of you. Right. And I'm exhorting the elders. Then when you get to four, it comes back to the chief shepherd. Shall, ye shall receive a crown. It went back to all of you away from the elders. The way you said it a minute ago, it was the crown was to the elders, not to everybody. Well... I did not mean it that way. Okay. Well, but so what I am saying in verse five. one through four is, is Peter is speaking to the elders there. Verse one through three. One through four. In four, though, he is also including the whole brethren. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's speaking to everybody in four, so yeah, he's still. Being he's speaking to everybody in verses one through four. No, no, but I'm saying though he's speaking about the elders in one to three, yeah. and back to everybody back in four. Yes. But he's also speaking about the elders in verse 4. That's in everybody. Okay. The elders is part of everybody. Okay. All right. I All right. So. I want, for me, I wasn't. I know. I know. You weren't being argumentative. <laughs> well, I'm trying to be. <laughs> I didn't accept it uh, okay. as you being argumentative either. So. The reward for elders is not measured by material gain nor praise of men, but the reward is a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And this is kind of what Peter's saying here in verse 4, along with all the other members of the congregation, is that if you do your job properly, and again, whether it be teacher, preacher, deacon, elder, song leader, uh, whatever your talent is, if you do it properly, then in fact there will be a reward, a crown of glory that does not fade away. Any thoughts? I yeah. think verses 1 to 4 is applying to elders, and starting at verse 5, he's talking about everybody else. Well, he is, but in verse 1, it does say, The elders who are among you I exhort. And so when he's saying among you, okay, that would include that he's speaking to everybody because he wants everybody to understand the responsibilities of the elders, but he also wants the elders to understand their responsibility as well. Does that make sense? Are you doing uh, Agree or disagree? You're welcome to disagree. Well, I'm still thinking he's just speaking to the elders that are among them. Okay. All right. All right. He's addressing the elders and their responsibility. And if they do their, their job properly, they will have a crown that doesn't go away. Yeah. And then he's addressing everybody else after that. Okay. All right. I won't, I won't argue with you. All right. So let's look at verses 5 through 9 then. And... Uh, Janice, I guess we're back to you. If you'll read chapter 5, verses 5 through 9. 
you younger men likewise be subject to your elders and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another for God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Okay. I'm kind of guilty like John. He forgot to turn his mic on uh, the other day. and So I've turned it on now. People can hear me at home, but now they can hear me at home better. So... For those at home, I apologize that you couldn't hear me as well as you can now. All right, so we look at chapter 5 and we begin in verse 5. What he's doing here in verses 5 through 9 is he, he's, uh, we have exhortations regarding younger men and also other Christians as well. And so in verse 5, uh, he's talking about being subject one to another. He starts out by saying, likewise, you younger people. All right, he addressed the elders first. Now he's talking about younger people. While the reference to younger people is brief, it is nonetheless very important here. Because younger members of the church might act rashly and react inappropriately under the pressure of tribulation. In a moment, they could destroy everything but, but, uh, that others had worked hard to achieve in meeting the challenges of persecution. Um, Peter's simple but firm advice to them was listen to your elders. And that's still a good idea this day. The, dirt, the church does not need to have others perceive us as encouraging our youth to be rebellious. And in every age, young Christians must flee youthful lust. Look at 2 Timothy in chapter 2 and verse 22, uh, John. Flee also useful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Okay. And also be an example to the believers. Uh, young people should be a, an example as well as, as older people. That's one of the things I try to do with uh, our, our young Christians like Connor and Micah and, and uh, Alan. Uh, when I see them sitting off by themselves with their little uh, cell phones and their video games and everything, I go over to them and I say, look, you get up and you start meeting some people here, Christians, you start greeting and doing uh, your Christian duties here instead of playing your little games. Uh, it's, they can learn those things at a young age. I come in and I see the baptistry lights not on and Micah's sitting there, Micah? He knows exactly what I'm talking about, and he'll get up and go turn that light on. So, and, you know, as, as older p Christians, and I'm not talking about elders here, I'm talking about all of us as more mature Christians have a responsibility to help develop these young people. And new converts. Uh, we have a situation right now. Yes, Jensen. I wouldn't know that you would have uh, to turn on the back because you like, you look at me and go, Jensen! <laughs> <laughs> no, but in your case, I'd say, Jensen, light. But he hadn't told you You'll 15 times to do it before. Oh, okay. For your I case, going, what? For your case <laughs> Jensen. You tell him enough times, he automatically knows. When you Jensen, for your case, ringing the classroom bell to start classes is not an elder's responsibility. So yours is going to be Jensen Bell. <laughs> well, I wasn't asked to do it yet, so I'm, I'm still, I'm still, You're still okay. in training. <laughs> okay, First uh, Timothy chapter four, verse twelve, Kathy. And Tychicus, I have sent to Ephesus. No, it's Second Timothy. Whoops. I was going to say that didn't make sense. That didn't make sense to me. I thought you were talking. Oh. That's you got 2 Timothy up there. I do have, well, no, oh. well, okay. Yeah, okay. That's supposed to be 1 well, yeah. Timothy chapter 4, verse yeah, 12. I didn't put first. Not, I'm sorry, that's my mistake. <laughs> my bad, as the young people say. My bad. Well, I was trying to figure out what you was trying to say there. Yeah, I didn't get the tie in there. Okay. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, mm. in purity. 
There you go. See, that's what I meant to have. That works there. Too. That's a lot better. Yeah, it does. And I, I have First Timothy chapter four, verse twelve in my notes here. I just didn't have it up there. I'm sorry. Is that computer messing up again? Uh, probably. Okay, so he talks about the fact that yes, all of you be submissive. King James Version uses the word subjection, uh, and you may find a little bit different word in a few of the other versions. But subjection is not merely a required duty or submissive, not a required duty. It is the action of a humble heart. And this same word is used in Second, uh, in First Peter chapter two. What did I? I don't. Oh, I don't have it up there. No, I don't have it up there. First Peter chapter two and verse thirteen. Turn over there. And verse thirteen says. Therefore submit yourselves, and that's the word I'm looking for, to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king is supreme. And what I'm saying here, it's not merely a required duty, but it's an action of the humble heart. We also look at verse 18 there in chapter 2. And verse 18 says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear. Again, not a required duty, but an action of a humble heart. We go to chapter 3 of First Peter verses 1 through 5, where we were looking at submission to husbands in the case of wives. It says, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be warned, won by the conduct of their wives. The word submissive there is not a uh, required duty, but it is an action of a humble heart. Okay? The word is a military term of rank that literally means to lie down, line up <coughs> under, is what it means. It does not mean one is inferior to another, but it does demonstrate an attitude that seeks to honor another. Not only should we submit to the leadership of elders of the church, but when all Christians render one, in, one to another, whatever is possible, the church will be strong and firmly united in love. And that brings us to Philippians, the second chapter, verses 1 through 5, Florence. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind, that nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Okay. So just because Ron and I serve as elders uh, <laughs> does not mean we're superior to anybody else in this congregation. We're Christians just like anyone else. We're all equal in that aspect. We have a responsibility. Just because Jensen is a deacon does not mean that Jensen is superior over anyone else. He has a responsibility just as anyone else uh, as a Christian, but he also has specific responsibilities as a deacon as well. And so all of us are to have a humility. All of us are to be clothed with humility, and that's what he further says here in verse 5, and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. What do we mean when we say be clothed with humility? Put it on, wear it, be it. Okay. Don't just show that you're humble at certain times. Okay. Be can we can we think of any biblical examples that shows us what Jesus really <laughs> means by humility? Washing of his feet. Washing, Washing of his feet. Washing uh, feet. <laughs> in fact, if you go to John the thirteenth chapter, verses ten through seventeen, I think that's where you probably are, Jensen. Uh, Jesus taught his apostles this disposition of heart when he tied a towel about him and he washed the disciples' feet. Uh, go ahead and read that for us, Jensen. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him before he said, You are, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done? Done to you, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, "Well, for uh, so am I." Oh, two seventeen. Yes. 
If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent the greater than he is who sent him. Okay. So Jesus gave a, a uh, clear example here of what humility is all about. Uh, he was willing to humble himself, and, uh, and he taught the disciples uh, humility. And, uh, and you and I can learn from that as well, just as Janice said, uh, the description she used. Any thoughts about that? All right, well, that's the second bell. So we'll conclude chapter 5 next week. And uh, if you need questions to chapter 5, I have them here. I'll have the questions to Second Peter chapter 1 here next week as well.